Okay, so our speaker today is Dr. Lawrence Hirsch. Dr. Hirsch is a professor of neurology at Yale University, chief of division of epilepsy and EEG, co-director of critical care EEG monitoring, co-director of the Yale Comprehensive Epilepsy Center. He's also a program director of clinical neurophysiology fellowship, as well as co-director of critical care EEG fellowship. Dr. Hirsch received his uh, um, Bachelor's of Art degree in computer medicine from the University of Pennsylvania, completed medical school and intern year at Yale University. He was then trained in neurology at Columbia University, followed by a fellowship in epilepsy and EEG at the same institution. He remained at Columbia on the faculty prior to his return to Yale, where he created and directed the continuous EEG monitoring program at NYP Columbia University Medical Center, which he directed for 10 years and became professor of clinical neurology. Uh, Dr. Hurd's research focuses on EEG in, crit in the critical ill, status epilepticus, brain stimulation, epilepsy surgery, electrocorticography, brain mapping, effectiveness and tolerability of anti-epileptic drugs, and uh, SUDEP. Dr. Hirsch has published more than 150 original research manuscripts and more than 100 invited reviews, editorials, and chapters. He is co-author of the first ever Atlas of EEG in Critical Care. Dr. Hirsch has directed symposia and lectured at many national and international epilepsy and neurology meetings. He's the founder and former chair of the Critical Care EEG Monitoring Research Consortium, which now includes more than 50 centers. His commitment to teaching and education was recognized by Louis P. Rowland Teaching Award for Outstanding Teaching at Columbia and later by the Attending of the Year Award from Yale Neurology Residence. Please welcome Dr. Lawrence Hirsch. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and for that nice introduction. Let me go ahead and share. Let me know if there's any problem or you should see my slides now. All right, good. Okay, so let me get started. I'm gonna try and cover um, EEG monitoring in general in the critically ill, and then a little bit about uh, Norse and a little bit about just managing non-convulsive seizures and status in general. Uh, these are my disclosures. I make I make money doing this. I co-authored an atlas. I'm a consultant for Cerebell, which I, I will mention. It's a rapid EEG device. And I uh, stole slides from a bunch of friends and colleagues. We kind of share slides. It's hard to remember whose was whose in the beginning. Um, these are unrelated things. OK, so why do we do continuous EEG monitoring in the critically ill? Well, it's really because of the high prevalence of non-convulsive seizures and the fact that you can't diagnose them any other way. Um, so this is a whole bunch of studies in different settings, different diagnoses. The solid bar shows the rate of finding <clears throat> seizures at all in these, I'm sorry, the rate of non-convulsive seizures. Okay, so somewhere around 20 to 30% of patients will be having non-convulsive seizures uh, when they're hooked up to EEG in ICUs. Uh, the second bar in the Yankee stripes is the percent of those patients whose seizures were exclusively non-convulsive. So without EEG, you wouldn't know they had seizures at all. Uh, and this is a very recent systematic review of about 20,000 patients from the literature and showing that really the same thing. So this is on the left is the prevalence of non-convulsive seizures and on the right is non-convulsive status. And at the bottom, you see the uh, overall rate. It's about 18% of patients hooked up will have uh, non-convulsive seizures and about half of those will be in non-convulsive status. I and mean, they also compared to routine EEG and found that continuous EEG or prolonged recording was three times as likely to detect seizures compared to the routine one. So I use the iceberg analogy. The majority of uh, patients will have, who have seizures in the ICU will have exclusively non-convulsive ones. Sometimes you'll be lucky and see the clinical ones just at the bedside, but for the rest, you need your EEG tech or some other way to get EEG recordings. So just to give a, a, a quick sample, there was one day where we had five or six patients in non-convulsive status. This is just two of them. Um, so th this is an 69-year-old gentleman who was, was in because of a subdural hematoma had been evacuated four days ago, 
had one spell of shaking, was given two milligrams of lorazepam, but was still stuporous and they were having trouble weaning him off the vent. Uh, Looks like my video disappeared, but the video just shows a guy lying there sleeping. So it's not really uh, worth much anyway. But this is um, a full EEG of him while he's just lying there sleeping, no hint of any seizure activity. Um, and you can see an evolving seizure. The top half is the left. And then it ends with periodic discharges. Uh, after another 10 seconds or so, the periodic discharges stop as well. And this is the quantitative EEG, which we leave running at the bedside on all our patients. And we can also look in remotely and it helps make very rapid Im impressions of the EEG. Uh, so there's a variety of measures that shows the seizures in this patient. So this is two hours of EEG compressed. This is actually a seizure detector. This is a measure of rhythmicity. Uh, the next one is a compressed spectral array shows all, all the different frequencies of the EEG. Then there's a symmetry measure and an amplitude measure. And in this case, every one of them shows a clear sudden change during the seizures. And you click on these and see the raw EEG. Um, so this shows you can look quickly at, uh, see there's about three seizures an hour in this patient. And in this case, just another bolus of IV leucosamide um, got rid of the seizures. You see that was given here and in the second half, there's no seizures. Um, and then after the seizures were treated, he became much more alert and oriented, was able to be extubated the next day. So another case the same day, uh, it was a woman with an old left middle cerebral artery infarct, some residual deficit, uh, had some seizures, probable seizures that were treated with levetiracetam and they stopped, but now came in the hospital with a gastrointestinal illness, um, was confused and more aphasic than baseline. So a little worsening of her baseline neurologically. Uh, again, she's just sleeping the whole time on the video. There's absolutely nothing to see. And you'll see her, her EEG at baseline showed periodic discharges, but then suddenly it would switch into this uh, lower voltage fast pattern. Uh, continuing on, we'll see becomes very obvious. Uh, left hemisphere seizures that spread some to the right. Not subtle at all. Again, she has no clinical signs at all, just lying there sleeping. And this is her quantitative EEG. She's having about 15 uh, seizure, seizures per hour. And if anything, it was getting gradually worse. And in this case, an IV phenytoin load actually got rid of the seizures. Uh, so she returned to her neurologic baseline and remained on anti-seizure meds. Um, so a big question that comes up is how long you should monitor these patients. Um, back up one second. So that as far as who should be monitored, uh, it's really the biggest risk factors are coma and prior clinical seizures. So if you had a recent seizure or even remote ones, have ever had seizures in your life, those are the two main clinical risk factors. Okay, so that's really the only clinical features uh, you need to keep in mind. Uh, when deciding who, who to monitor. Um, so pretty much anybody with acute brain injury and altered alertness, we will be monitoring. Um, and sepsis is another big category. So people who are septic and unable to follow commands, they will have about a 10% rate of seizures uh, and a much higher rate of periodic discharges. So as far as how long patients should be monitored, so the American Clinical Neurophysiology Society published guidelines in 2015 um, that showed that if you, if you were not comatose, a 24-hour screen is enough. Uh, but if they were comatose, you needed 48 hours and maybe even longer if there were periodic discharges or if you were withdrawing sedation like midazolam or other anti-seizure medications. Uh, but after that guideline, some additional literature came out that's uh, helpful and can be more specific and can actually lead to shorter monitoring sessions. Um, so this is known as the start on the right here, the two helps to be score. Um, and you really don't need the, to remember much about the whole score, except that having a seizure gets you a point. That's the only clinical feature. The rest is EEG and the rest is anything epileptiform. So any epileptiform pattern at all will get you at least a point. And then this is your score. Uh, if you have more, 
a score of two or higher, very high rate of seizures, more than 25%, and you need at least 24 hours without seizures before you can be confident a patient is not going to have them. Um, so here's the recommended duration. If you want to be 95% certain they're not having non-convulsive seizures, and how long you need to record to be 98% certain. Um, so if they have one point on this scale, so that means either a seizure at any point, recent or remote, or anything epileptiform, uh, then you need 12 hours to get to that 95% level and a little over 24 for the 98. If the score is zero, this is where the scale was very helpful. So uh, no clinical seizure, nothing epileptiform in the first hour of EEG. This is based on the first hour. There's only a 3% chance you're gonna find seizures um, and you only need to record one hour to get to that, to get uh, fairly certain you're not gonna see them um, and three hours to get to that 98% level. So these are the patients who have a zero on the scale where if you have nothing epileptiform in the first hour, that's probably all you need. Um, and I mentioned even with sepsis or a primary systemic illness, there's still a reasonable rate of seizures. Um, so this shows a, a bunch of studies. Uh, again, the same thing, the dark blue bars show the percent of patients with non-convulsive seizures. And the second one, the percent that are exclusively non-convulsive. So in a, in a variety of different settings, these are patients without any acute brain injury. So they're in with primary medical illness and the majority had sepsis. Um, so you see somewhere around a 10% rate of seizures, but again, a much higher percent will have periodic discharges as well. So why do we care about all these non-convulsive seizures or periodic discharges and, and do they matter? So this is where the last uh, five years or so, there's, there's been a lot of research um, so we know during non-convulsive seizures, all these physiologic effects occur. And these are harmful to the brain, particularly in the setting of acute brain injury. Um, so I'll just uh, let you read those. So one of the interesting ones is these peri-injury depolarization. So those are actually even more common than seizures. And they've been shown to be associated with secondary neuronal injury as well. And they're in a variety of, of acute brain injuries, uh, but you pretty much need intracranial recordings to recognize those. So there's still some evidence that you can do it on scalp, but it's very difficult. Uh, this was a study in patients with spontaneous intraparenchymal hemorrhage, and they looked at matched groups and compared those who had non-convulsive seizures that those that did not, and found midline shift increased in those who had non-convulsive seizures and it decreased in the ones that did not. Uh, there was also an association with worse NIH stroke scale scores and a trend towards worse outcome in this study from UCLA. Uh, this is another study in traumatic brain injury patients. And these were ones getting invasive monitoring. So they looked at intracranial pressure. They looked at lactate pyruvate ratio on cerebral microdialysis. So that's this tiny catheter in the brain parenchyma that just measures the interstitial fluid and a variety of things. And the uh, lactate pyruvate ratio is the most accepted measure of neuronal injury. And normal is less than 40. Um, it can also measure glutamate. And they looked at uh, around the time of non-convulsive seizures, so that's this ictal row, compared to times when they were not having uh, non-convulsive seizures. And you can see intracranial pressure more than doubled Lactate pruvate ratio went up to uh, levels known to be associated with neuronal death, and glutamate went up sixfold, including to um, levels known to be neurotoxic. So that's in purely non-convulsive seizures in humans with traumatic brain injury. And then if you do MRIs on these people later, it turns out that patients who had non-convulsive seizures had more hippocampal atrophy, and that tended to be on the same side where the seizures were a little more evidence of cause and effect there. Uh, so what about more functional or longer term outcome? So this was a study in children, long term outcome of 137 kids who, who were developmentally normal before their acute admission to the pediatric ICU. And a multivariate analysis, they found electrographic status was associated with worse functional outcome on a pediatric scale uh, with a ratio of 6.4 of chances of 
having impairment. Um, a lower quality of life by a dramatic amount. And I think this was the first study to show a high rate of new onset epilepsy in these patients who come in with acute symptomatic non-convulsive status. So just about half of these children went on to develop epilepsy compared to 11% of a matched control group uh, getting EEG monitoring, but without non-convulsive status. Uh, this is a different study. The prior one was from CHOP in Philly. This one is from Toronto. An even bigger group of pediatric ICU patients, and they looked at neurologic decline. Uh, this is short-term outcome. Uh, they found neurologic decline in two-thirds of these kids, and they found a cutoff of about 20%. So this was the, if the seizure burden, so that's the percent of time the patient is seizing. If that goes over 20%, there was a marked rise in the chance of neurologic decline and the severity. Um, and this actually has been incorporated into the new definition of non-convulsive status, which uses a 20% seizure burden as a cutoff. Uh, it actually had not been formally defined before, but most people were using 50%. So that's been lowered to 20%. Um, and this is from that paper showing the maximal hourly seizure burden and the chances of worsening on this pediatric functional scale. And you can see there's really a dose response curve there. So what about adults? Uh, so similar findings, this was in a subarachnoid hemorrhage group from Columbia. Uh, this was 400 patients, 50 of them had seizures, almost all those were non-convulsive status and all the seizures were non-convulsive. Uh, there was a median seizure burden of only six hours, which doesn't sound so terrible. Uh, but even with that, they found that at three months on multivariate analysis, the seizure burden was associated with disability, with mortality, and with cognition. Uh, so th this is a graph from their data showing as the hours of non-convulsive seizures increase, the chance of unfavorable functional outcome goes up and the cognitive score declines. Okay, again, showing a dose response curve and showing it really doesn't have to be that many hours. So um, the sooner you stop these, the better the patients will do. Um, just make one other comment about that is, well, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but speed is really the key. So diagnosing these early and treating them early, they're much easier to stop if you get to them quickly. They're much more responsive uh, to your first medication. Um, so I said I would talk about treating non-convulsive seizures, and there's really not that much data. Um, really, the only prospective randomized trial was the TRENDS trial that showed that leucosamide was non-inferior to phosphenitoin. Okay, so uh, you can essentially say they're, they were largely equivalent, um, and that was for purely non-convulsive seizures. All the other literature is really extrapolated from either the epilepsy literature or the convulsive status epilepticus literature. Um, so this was a, a very recent uh, review article uh, we did with uh, Pablo Bravo, a neurointensivist and uh, recent ICU EEG fellow at Yale, uh, put this together. Um, so we tried to make a flow sheet and this was as simple as we could get it. Uh, so once you diagnose non-convulsive seizures, you wanna use, um, IV anti-seizure medications. And you can use any of these. So we call it tier one. They're all uh, roughly equivalent. Let me, uh, I think I can switch to the laser pointer. There you go. Um, so we just saw the ESET trial for convulsive status epilepticus that showed that these three, levetiracetam, valproate, phosphenitone, they're all really exactly equal in efficacy and tolerability for convulsive status. And there's data that all of them work for non-convulsive as well, uh, a little less on levetiracetam, and, um, but plenty on the others. Um, and then leucosamide from that TRENDS trial showed it was non-inferior to phosphenitone, so that makes that equal to the others. And then brivirastam um, is also available IV. And in comparing it to levetiracetam, it's the same mechanism, much more potent binder to SV2A, and it gets into the brain much faster. So there's plenty of rationale for using it in uh, status, it just hasn't had a, a uh, high quality prospective randomized trial to prove it. So we put all those equal um, 
yeah, benzos are, are fine, but they're sedating. So if you want to see an exam right after, that's not ideal. And if you fail one of those, these tier one ones, we would just rapidly go right onto another one. You load it. If you see no response, we usually won't even continue it. Just move on to a different one and load that one as well. And you need to use loads. Just starting it won't do it. Then you got to wait a few days till you get reasonable levels. And phenobarb is equally effective, but because of all the issues with tolerability, sedation, long half-life, et cetera, that's considered a lower tier. Um, so then if seizures stop, great. You observe them, check levels, et cetera. Um, but if seizures do not go away, then you get to this box where we have a decision point related to whether they're comatose, coma or stupor combined, and they have a high seizure burden. It's really uh, somewhere in the 10 to 20% if I had to put a number on it. So if you have both of those comatose with high seizure burden, that's when we usually go to the anesthetics. Okay, so midazolam is our usual preferred one, especially if you need longer term. Um, and all these things can be combined. We do go to ketamine fairly, fairly frequently when they're refractory to these or they have blood pressure issues. So going back to this point, if they're more alert, or if they have only a low seizure burden, if they, if they have a seizure an hour and it only lasts a minute or two, we usually will try and avoid anesthetics um, and either give more of those tier one ones or go on to these uh, enteral ones. So put it down the NG tube. Um, and we've broken them into these tiers. This one is, isn't so evidence-based. This one's more opinion. Um, but we like parampanol because of the theoretical AMPA blockade, which is great for refractory status. Um, the GABA receptors are internalized and GABA agonists don't work as well in later stages of status. Um, and then you, you can see the other drugs here. They're, they're all reasonable to add on. Um, and again, one seizure stop, if there's minimal seizure burden, you just watch them, wean the drips, um, optimize your other drugs. And so that's as simple as we can make the management of non-convulsive status. And I ho hope that's helpful in some way. Um, all right, so does it, is it easy to set up a continuous EEG monitoring pathway and uh, does it really help patients? So this was a, a really nice little study from Philadelphia. Well, all they did is create a pathway to streamline things, mostly communication about uh, hooking up an EEG, reading it, and getting uh, anti-epileptic drugs on board. And they were able to get the interval from seizure onset to administrating drugs down from 139 minutes to 64 minutes. And the amazing thing was they showed that seizure termination occurred more frequently after the initial anti-epileptic drug in patients in this new pathway. So the first drug was effective in 67% of cases with this faster pathway compared to 27%. It wasn't that it was different treatment, it was just earlier. It shows the dramatic difference in, in how it works. Um, this is another study that just looked at the time it took to get EEG hooked up as one of many features looked at for prognosticating in uh, neonates and children getting EEG monitoring. And they found both in neonates and in the older kids that the time to hook up continuous EEG was an independent risk factor for mortality with a, a measurable amount per day of delay. I thought that was an uh, interesting study. Um, another question about the whether it's cost effective or not. So there's two widely cited studies on this. This one compared continuous EEG to routine EEG in patients who were intubated and hospitalized in this giant inpatient database across the country. Um, and they found that continuous EEG was associated with lower mortality compared to routine, uh, highly significant. Uh, and there, there was no difference in length of stay or cost in this study. And all these patients were intubated and had some kind of EEG. So they concluded continuous EEG is favorably associated with inpatient survival and mechanically ventilated patients without adding significant charges. Uh, the other widely cited study was this one. It was a little different in that they compared patients who got continuous EEG to those who did not. So that included everybody, including people who never had any EEG. 
Uh, and they again found mortality was lower in those who got continuous EEG. Uh, and that was significant, but in this case, there actually was a greater cost. And all of this was still still significant after they adjusted for as many uh, hospital and patient characteristics as they could. But those are giant database retrospective studies. Um, so there was the ACNS created nomenclature for what to call the different patterns in these patients. Uh, back in 2012. And this led to a bunch of studies on what these patterns mean. So I'll just show you one or two of them. Uh, so this was a study we did looking at lateralized rhythmic delta activity. And it uh, turned out this actually had the same associ association with seizures as what used to be called PLEDs, now known as lateralized periodic discharges. So in this cohort, 63% of patients who had lateralized rhythmic delta, and the rhythmic is the key, this isn't just focal slowing, it's very rhythmic slowing. Uh, so 63% of those had seizures during the acute illness compared to 57% with lateralized periodic discharges in that same cohort. Um, then we also did a multi-center study through our uh, research consortium of 4,700 patients who got continuous EEG. This is, they're all entered uh, during clinical care into the centralized database over a couple of years. And this is kind of a summary of the findings. Um, the interesting thing was the faster the pattern was, so whether you had two hertz or one hertz, lateralized rhythmic delta made a difference. Uh, so the faster it was, there was a higher association with seizures. It's not that the pattern itself was seizures, it's that you saw definite seizures at another time. So lateralized pyrrhic discharges were always highly associated with seizures, no matter what frequency, but it was even higher as you got the faster ones. For lateralized rhythmic delta and generalized periodic discharges, it only reached a, a significant association when you got to 1.5 Hertz or faster. And generalized rhythmic delta was not associated with seizures at all. Uh, there's a brand new version of this that just came out in January. Um, and really the good news is it didn't get rid of any of the prior ones so you don't have to forget anything you learned, assuming you learned the old one. Um, but we basically added a bunch of new ones. Uh, so these are all the new terms that are defined. Uh, electrographic seizures is actually defined in this one. Um, birds, the ictal and erectile continuum, et cetera. And uh, for the EEGers, I'm happy to go over all that in a separate session sometime if you like. Uh, but all these things are now defined formally in a guideline and none of them actually were before. So um, that's almost all I'm gonna say about continuous EEG monitoring. Again, the key is, is more rapid initiation of EEGs and an easier way to do that. Um, then we need a, a network of EEG readers that are immediately available or you know, no matter where you are really shouldn't be that hard to do in this day of remote access. Um, and we need real-time monitoring. So just recording doesn't help the patient if you're not looking at it. And that was a problem of a uh, trial done recently in Europe of studying continuous EEG monitoring and its effect on outcome, but they had no one looking at it overnight. So there was no way to have timely treatment. Um, and then we clearly need a lot more research on which patterns need to be treated and how aggressively. Uh, so I mentioned obtaining rapid EEGs. Uh, I think uh, you guys have at least a little experience with this, um, but this is one rapid EEG device. It's basically a headband you put around the head. This is the cerebell device. Again, I'm a consultant for them. So that's the disclosure. Um, but there've been several papers published using this. Um, and the other great thing about it is it's a little handheld device. You do not need a tech. There's a short video that will train you and certify you and how to put these on. And uh, I've done a bunch of them. It's, it really, it takes five or six minutes to get EEG running on this thing. Um, so this was a study in multi multiple academic sites looking at, um, they basically, whenever a continuous EEG was ordered, they put one of these on right away while waiting for the tech to arrive. Um, again, academic centers doing a lot of continuous monitoring. It still took an average of somewhere around four hours to get continuous EEG recording with a full setup. But the 
uh, with this device itself, it took a median of five minutes to get a recording. Um, and just to show you what it looks like, I have an example. So this was a 71 year old with uh, epilepsy from a prior meningioma, uh, came in with some pulmonary issues, seizures that resolved giving some medication, but was persistently encephalopathic. And we popped on this device, you basically get the bitemporal chains. They're ha clearly having seizure activity. It actually has some customary seizure detection software and shows the seizure burden. If you look at the bottom here, it shows seizures were abundant to continuous for this entire time. Um, so obviously you can treat based on this. There's no doubt this person is seizing and it only took you six minutes to diagnose instead of four hours. Um, this is a different patient, very similar story with a seizure, got, got some medication, stopped seizing, but was sedated. And the, the EG showed seizures. Um, and if you look down at the bottom, it showed they were between 10 and 50% in the very beginning, uh, but they were treated and no, no further ones occurred. So this is one where it was treated very quickly uh, because of this device and very successfully. All right, I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, NORS or new onset refractory status epilepticus. Uh, so I'll talk about that. So um, it has nothing to do with this NORS or this, this fires, but I will talk about fires as well. Uh, so what is NORS? So it was always considered uh, just unexplained onset of refractory status epilepticus. I'll get into the formal definition in a couple slides. Uh, but this was an older study that used that, that definition. Uh, you had to have no etiology discovered in the first 48 hours. Um, and you, to get in this study, you had to have immune studies sent because we were trying to look at etiology. And this again was from our critical care consortium. So we found 130 cases in 13 centers. It turned out to be 20% of refractory status cases. Uh, two thirds of them are female and that's pretty consistent. Um, so it turned out there was a prodrome in 60% of patients, some kind of prior viral illness, usually a minor one, uh, and included fever in a third of all cases, which would now qualify as fires. So it's really just Norse with prior fever. Um, eventually, a probable etiology was found in almost half of the patients, although some of them are kind of iffy on whether they're actually the cause. Uh, but 37% were autoimmune or paraneoplastic. Anti-NMDA was most common, uh, voltage-gated potassium channel was second. Um, if the patients had hallucinations in their prodrome, they all had NMDA, but it was only a few patients. Um, there were a few infections found. Overall outcome was poor, 22% died in the hospital. But if you look at long-term outcome uh, in survivors, they actually not, don't necessarily get back to normal, but they do reasonably well. Um, and immune therapies were used less often in the cryptogenic cases, as opposed to those that had some autoimmune apparent neoplastic etiology found. But otherwise the cases were virtually identical, including CSF findings and the, the level of inflammation. So more and more people are assuming the ones where you don't find anything are still most likely uh, immune based or in, at least related to uh, neuroinflammation. Um, and giving immune therapies fairly early and more often than in the past uh, based on some of these studies. Um, so we had a uh, big consensus conference in Salzburg, Austria years ago and, and published this, um, not only the definitions, but also some summary of a lot of the presentations there uh, published in epilepsy in 2018. So uh, this is for the consensus definition. The problem was the pediatricians and the adult doctors were all using totally different terms for the same thing. And uh, other countries were using totally different terms for the same thing. So we really just wanted to come up with a standard definition to allow some studying, improve communication, give families and doctors something to look up um, and uh, to, to raise money. Um, so, we created this team, it was half pediatric, half adult, and included a, a, a whole bunch of six different countries. Uh, it was endorsed by the Critical Care Monitoring Consortium. And this, so this is the definition. 
Uh, so NORS is a clinical presentation, so it's not a specific diagnosis. So a patient just presents with NORS. Uh, and you cannot have active epilepsy. Um, has to be new onset of refractory status. So it doesn't have to be super refractory, just refractory. So all that means is you failed two drugs. Um, without a clear, acute, or active structural toxic or metabolic cause. Okay. And you're allowed up to 72 hours to figure that out. Uh, usually by somewhere around 24 hours, you'll have a pretty good idea as long as you got your imaging and spinal fluid. Um, and this includes viral infections and autoimmune syndromes. So they can, they just present as NORS. So you can say he had NORS due to anti-NMDA encephalitis, or he had anti-NMDA presenting as NORS either way. Um, The other thing, again, it's typically super refractory, meaning it's failed 24 hours of anesthesia, but that's not required. It just has to be refractory. And if you never find a cause, then we call it cryptogenic Norse or Norse of unknown etiology. But that requires weeks and waiting for all your test results to come back. You don't want to wait till then to make any decisions about treatment. And it's still called Norse much earlier than that. Uh, and it does not include epilepsy partialis continua where the patient's fully awake. All right, so fires, this is a term that pediatricians are much more familiar with. This is pretty much what they called Norris in kids. It is now officially a subcategory of Norris at any age. And all it means is you had a prior fever. And that fever had to start more than 24 hours before the status. Okay, so it doesn't count if you just had fever an hour before, because that could just be uh, you're much more common and benign febrile status epilepticus. So you had to have fever between one day and two weeks prior to the onset of refractory status. This applies in all ages. And it doesn't matter whether you have fever at the time you're seizing, as long as you had it between one day and two weeks prior. All right. Um, we, we set up this website and this foundation largely through uh, Nora Wong has been the director of this. and. Um, she uh, is a super motivated mother who lost her son to Norse. Uh, he, he was college age several years ago and she's created really this uh, amazing foundation has given a bunch of money and time as well. She and her, she and her husband have donated to this. Um, and so check out this website. There's a whole bunch of resources there, including a diagnostic evaluation. This is just a short list of things that have presented as Norse um, so they're all, they're all in there as things you can send. Um, and it's broken up into what to do in the first 24 hours, uh, where it's your basic things about, about history, send your HSV, and usually we, treat, we end up treating for it for a short time, um, get your imaging. And then there's tables uh, for all the things to send in different scenarios. So as far as infectious things, these are the ones to send. Um, We've recently been doing metagenomic testing. So that's where you test the spinal fluid for any non-human genetic material. And you can find some, uh, some infections you never thought of. Um, and that is commercially available through uh, UCSF now. Um, and then in immunocompromised, there's some more things to check. This is the uh, autoimmune diagnostic checklist. Most of these are available in panels now. So it's not as hard as it looks. And again, more recently, we've been sending serum and CSF cytokine panels, uh, which we're hoping will help us give rational personalized medicine on which immune drugs to use. And we are giving more and more specific uh, immune drugs targeting uh, certain interleukins. Um, and then I always think in these cases, you should store extra CSF and freeze it so you can do PCRs and other things later. Um, as far as looking for paraneoplastic, these are some of the recommended studies for metabolic workups, toxicology, and genetic, mostly looking for mitochondrial disorders. Um, so that's all on norseinstitute.org. Obviously, no time to go over all these. Um, and then this just points out if, if they're not in a place that can do continuous EEG monitoring, they should be transferred very early. And if they're not at a place that is comfortable managing refractory status with immune treatment, they should be sent somewhere where they can. 
And by 72 hours, we're usually starting immune drugs and it's usually high dose steroids. Um, there's also tables for looking for certain clues for specific diagnoses. For example, if you see extreme delta brush on the EEG, you should think about anti-NMDA. Extreme spindles, you should think about mycoplasma. Um, if, you, if you see lots of oral lingual dyskinesias, that's another NMDA sign, et cetera. So these kinds of little clinical pearls are all listed in a table there. As far as treating Norse, obviously you want to treat the underlying condition if you can find it. Um, so we usually we make sure we're treating for herpes and cephalitis for the, until that testing comes back negative. Um, don't forget about treatable infections like Bartonella, mycoplasma. Those are easily treated, so definitely check for those. Um, and then you want to treat the seizures, and we're pretty aggressive about treating seizures and keeping it to a low seizure burden um, because we've seen people recover and uh, some of them who are left seizing for days end up with horrible epilepsy and severe amnesia and others have been four, six, eight weeks in coma and get back to really virtually normal cognition. Um, I have one patient who spent a month in coma with Norse who then later was accepted to Columbia grad school after all of that. And it was just cognitively completely back to baseline. Um, and these are extremely sick patients and it takes really good uh, critical care to keep these people alive and healthy. Uh, it's, it's, that, that's really the key, keeping the whole body healthy, not just the brain. Um, so what about more specific immunologic treatment? Um, so we know status epilepticus and seizures lead to increase in all these inflammatory uh, molecules. And in animals, the earlier you treat ant with anti-inflammatory drugs, their outcomes get much better, prevents progression, and it prevents epilepsy. Um, and in NOR specifically, there's upregulation of certain interleukins. Um, and this was a study comparing kids with fires to other neurodiagnoses and found specific elevations in, uh, in several things, including, including IL-6, that's the tocilizumab target. Um, Andreas von Ball and Rima Nabu have published on this and they consider Norse or fires a genetically determined post-infectious cytokine mediated disorder. That's kind of the leading theory on what's going on in most of these cases. Uh, genetic studies have shown if they, if uh, these common uh, epilepsy genes are present in any of these, they're rare. Uh, but there have been some cases. Uh, this was a, another study looking at genetics and found some genetics related to uh, interleukin-1, the, the receptor were found, um, and one SCN1A mutation. And some have found that mitochondrial function is relevant in these patients. Um, I mentioned this, this uh, paper kind of summarized all the literature on this back in 2018. As far as immune treatments that are out there in the literature, uh, most it's really all just case series, so a low level of evidence, but almost everybody's doing uh, one of these initially, steroids most commonly. And then more recently, you've seen more and more of either rituximab, anakinra. This is actually very popular now in children uh, with Norser fires. That's an IL-1 antagonist. So it started with one or two case reports. There was a recent series of 25 kids published. Again, it's, they're just reporting the outcomes and very hard to know if the anakinra helped them, um, but it seems to be pretty well tolerated. Uh, there was a series of adults getting tocilizumab and this drug is now very, very well studied in the COVID world, so we know much more about it. Uh, but there's, these patients had very high levels of IL-6, were given tocilizumab and six out of seven seemed to respond. Other things that have been reported, ketogenic diet, uh, hypothermia are some of the bigger ones. And ketogenic diet is used very commonly in, in children. So this is what the website looks like at the Norris Institute. Uh, there's a, a medical side, a patient and family side. Uh, this is our scientific advisory board, includes uh, pathologists, intensivists, adult, pediatric, and includes a bunch of countries too. 
Um, and we have a prospective observational trial going on where we're gathering 100 cases. We're now up to 43. It's taken a few years to get that high, but we're biobanking all the materials. And then there's competitive uh, calls for proposals on what to do with those specimens. And we've had several rounds of that. I'll show you who won those. There's also a family registry. So if you're not in this trial, uh, you can still enroll patients, either the doctors can or the family um, through this website. And it lets you enter basic information about the patient. And it's really concentrating on outcomes, including quality of life, mood, later epilepsy, et cetera. Uh, these are some of the grants that are funded by the Norse Institute, um, many of them using the samples from our ongoing study. Uh, so this was one on surveillance and how to follow how many cases of Norse there are. This is a uh, mouse model of fires. Uh, this is one looking at anakinra loaded nanoparticles for treating Norse. Uh, this is one on the genetics of fires. Uh, there's one on the microbiome. Um, and then one really looking at all kinds of uh, inflammatory markers and cytokines. Uh, that one's mostly out of Mayo. Um, so if you go to the website, you'll see all this. All the definitions are there. All this research information is there. Um, there's also an annotated reference list of all the recent literature. And there's a discharge planning guide that's very useful for families. If you have patients with Norse, please send them to this website. There's all kinds of useful stuff, including this discharge planning guide when they're talking about leaving the hospital. All right, so conclusions. These are conclusions about the ICU EEG monitoring, not about Norse. So non-convulsive seizures are common in the critically ill, including those without known brain disease. So that's mostly the sepsis ones, especially if coma or prior seizures most seizures in ICUs are non-convulsive, so more than half will be purely non-convulsive. And a 30 to 60 minute EEG will pick up somewhere around a third or a little bit more of these patients. There's extensive evidence, though no prospective randomized treatment trials, that non-convulsive seizures are harmful for the brain, especially in the setting of acute brain injury. So uh, they're associated with increased mass effect, metabolic crisis, hippocampal atrophy, Worse outcome, both short and long term, including quality of life, including neurologic function, and including the development of epilepsy. And there seems to really be a dose response curve in multiple studies in both kids and adults. Uh, take advantage of video and quantitative EEG software. Don't over interpret or over treat these findings, which I often see. <clears throat> but you should get EEGs as fast as you can. Uh, consider using these rapid devices. I think they, they really are helping treat non-convulsive status. Uh, continuous EEG monitor appears to be associated with better outcomes in large retrospective studies. We have guidelines and standardized definitions now of the EEG patterns. And very recently we have standard definitions of, of, of uh, a lot more things, including electrographic seizures, ictal and ictal continuum, et cetera. Uh, it's a critical care epilepsy EEG is rapidly moving. It's very interesting. There's still a ton to learn. So make sure you keep up with this and come to talks on it regularly. And uh, last but not least, go Nets. I can't give a talk to you guys without showing that. And with that, I will stop. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Dr. Hirsch. And we're now open for questions from the audience. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Hi, yes. Hey, Larry. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that fabulous talk. Um, and it's very timely because um, here at Kings County, um, we are setting up a critical care EEG service. And I, I think uh, you've already had some conversations with Gregory Capinos about it, but we're starting to really um, set up the systems so that we can actually do the appropriate monitoring, the decision making, and all of those wonderful things that you talked about. Um, so I had a couple, I had one specific question um, and then a, a, another request. Um, so the specific question is that um, when you are looking at, when you talked about the um, peri-injury depolarizations, 
um, and their potential prognostic value, um, which is still being studied. Um, has anyone been looking at the fast ripples or the malignant fast ripples in particular? Um, yes, mostly the UCLA group looked at uh, fast ripples. Uh, so that's a little burst of super high frequency activity. So ripples are 80 to 500 Hertz and fast ripples are 250 to 500, something like that. Um, and they've been associated with with epilepsy. So there, yeah, there is some preliminary evidence that if they're present, you're more likely to develop epilepsy later. I don't know if it would affect your acute management or not. And there's um, obviously still needs a lot more research on that, but there are some ongoing trials where they're doing invasive monitoring in mostly in traumatic brain injury patients. So I'm hoping we'll have a lot more um, about that because they are specifically looking at that question. I think it, it might have some prognostic value, might be a marker that an epileptic focus is already being set up or already present, I'm not sure which. So. Yeah. Because we have um, the ability to record fast ripples with scalp EEG using, I don't know if you're familiar with the biosignal system, which similar to Cerebell is rapid, not quite as rapid, but more complete. And because of the um, monitor, because of where the signal is amplified, um, we're able to get better uh, signal to noise ratio and pick up, potentially pick up these oscillations. Um, and they have devices that have the filters removed. So um, it's something that we're looking at. So I'd like to talk with you about that um, offline. Yeah, great. Um, I, I do also want to, um, as uh, AZ Rashid, one of our epilepsy and uh, neurocritical care people has just uh, chatted about, we had a patient uh, who presented during COVID uh, with North <laughs> and um, oral facial dyskinesias um, and was months in a, a coma, um, getting aggressive and wonderful treatment from everybody. I think probably most people on this uh, in the, on our services um, and has come back to clinic now about six months later um, and is doing incredibly well. Um, and so to really echo, if you get in early and treat the patient aggressively for their seizures, they, they can really have a wonderful outcome. So we're all really excited about that. And we've had a number of nurse patients over the years. So it's exciting to see how the field has changed and, and how the hard work that we do when they're not looking good really can can do well long term. Um, and yeah, so my I strong, I strongly, strongly encourage everyone to bring those patients back or at least let people know how they do later. Cause like the residents think everyone, no, everyone does poorly because they don't get to see them when they're wide awake and doing well later. So it's, yeah, it's important, important to bring them back, bring them back or at least let them know how they're doing. So. Yeah, long-term delayed gratification. <laughs> um, and so my request is actually, um, we are setting up these systems is, uh, can we um, impose on your kindness and have you come back or virtually um, and talk with our epilepsy critical care group uh, more specifically and give us some guidance. Yeah, process. sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This is truly a wonderful uh, talk. Thanks. Uh, there's a question in the chat about neonates with uh, run, spike runs that last for weeks after noxin to watch or to extinguish. I don't think I'm going to help you with that one. Don't really know if they're certainly if they're having frequent seizures. Yeah, we try and extinguish those, but don't know. And I don't take care of neonates, so I won't say too much more than that. Hey Larry, good morning. I have a question about a uh, Lerda. As uh, as you put many slides uh, on uh, the frequency matters, but um, I was wondering what's your uh, recent. Uh, clinical pathway, like when you see some intermittent lateralized rhythmic delta activity and there might be a correlate in an ICU patient, like maybe they're slightly less attentive, would you do a, a little bit of a low-dose benzo trial <clears throat> before committing the patient to Kepra, or do you treat every LERDA or LERDA plus uh, as soon as they reach uh, two hertz? Or last option that I, that I keep having in my mind, but I'm never um, uh, did it uh, because we don't have the technology uh, really uh, available here. But um, I remember also yourself and Jan publishing about sometimes rhythmic delta activity being a muffled version on the surface of deep seizures. So 
An alternative would be also, well, use intracortical EEG to decipher if those LERDA spells are actually just deep seizures with a very muffled um, uh, version on the surface. So out of those three options, what, what do you recommend in general? What is your style? Okay, well, Greg is a world expert in all this, but uh, those are tough. Those are tough questions. Um, so, uh, just a reminder. So, if you have Lerda, it's not that the Lerda itself is a seizure, as you pointed out. If you had intracranial monitoring, occasionally it is. Uh, but most of the time, we think it's not. It's just a marker. You're at very high risk of definite seizures. So, we will monitor those people longer. Yes, we usually do, but make sure they're on at least one anti-epileptic drug, especially if you're taking the EG off. If you wanna leave them on no meds and just watch them, that's fine as long as you continue to watch the EG for a couple of days, then, then I'm fine with that. Um, <clears throat> so it's really a marker of seizures, not seizures themselves. If there's a clinical carlet to it, that's a different story. So even if any pattern with a definite time-locked clinical carlet, that's seizure, that's not, not an interictal pattern. Um, whether it's harming the brain, that's a different story. So I think the usually a focal two hertz delta, I don't know that that's harming the brain or not. Um, when it comes to periodic epileptiform discharges, uh, so there is at least some literature that once that gets to two per second, as Greg's well aware, that's been shown with invasive monitoring to be associated with tissue hypoxia uh, and re real brain injury. So the brain can keep up till about two hertz in, in the acute brain injury setting at least. So once you get to two hertz or faster, we pretty much treat any epileptic from discharge at two hertz or faster, we treat and we try and get it below two hertz. Um, but rhythmic delta, we don't really do that. Um, you also alluded to those cases we published where the intracranial recording showed seizures and the scalp, actually the scalp usually showed nothing at all. Occasionally it showed some rhythmic delta correlating with bursts of poly spikes but we also showed a couple of cases where when the rhythmic delta went away and it pseudo normalized on scalp, that's actually when there were seizures on the intracranial. So it's very complicated. And I don't think you can ever assume what's going on in the intracranial. Uh, yeah, and we do do invasive recording in some of these patients, uh, mostly with depth electrodes. I wish we were doing more strips as well when we do craniotomies to look for the peri-injury depolarization, but we'll, we should be doing more and more of that. Um, and again, some of these big trials going on prospectively and TBI will help answer whether those are helpful and how often. Any update also on a background classification? Like everything has been focused, of course, on the periodic epileptiform discharges and those uh, periodic patterns and obviously seizures. But, uh, and also even burden of uh, interictal uh, spikes. But the background classification is something that is dearly needed also so that we all speak the same language in terms of mild, moderate, and severe, which backgrounds uh, are associated with a better outcome after TBI, but also ICH. So uh, can you teach us a little bit of, uh, on the background very briefly? Um, yes. I'm going to share again. You see this table? This is our uh, latest version of uh, a background scale. Uh, we have abstracts on this and we're presenting it to the Critical Care Consortium to make it a full consortium event. But we basically polled everyone on what they use and what's most important and how many categories they use across all the consortium centers and came up with this. So what people really use is the predominant frequency when awake, their posterior dominant rhythm, continuity uh, and reactivity are the main ones. So using those we've defined and they, oh, and this was the no, usual amount of how many levels they had. So it was mild, moderate, severe, but you could be in between mild to moderate and moderate to severe. Um, so that we've made this scale and it's actually the yellow ones are the required ones. So if you say somebody diffuse slowing, that means their most awake background is three to six hertz. They have no PDR. They're continuous or nearly continuous and the, their reactive uh, 
background is reactive. And if they're severe, they have to be uh, non-reactive or have serpids only an abnormal form of reactivity. So um, this hasn't been tested in any way, but it's more a consensus thing. And we've been using this for a couple of years, tweaking it a little, and this is what we've come up with. And um, hoping to make it more of a actually studied doing interrater agreements. Our prior interrater agreement we did on what people call background was terrible. People were all over the place and very few people had a standardized scale. And the most common one people used was a local institutional one. So that's why we want to make this really a uh, society or at least consortium wide one um, and really test the interrate agreement. So it's coming a little bit slowly, but it's coming. That, that's going to be discussed on the 4th of June. Uh, I think yeah, I saw it on the... Oh, yes. That yeah. will be one of the things, except I don't think I'm going to be there, but yeah. Yes. Any other questions? I know we're a little, little over the hour. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Now I can. Okay. The the when I trained a million years ago, there used to be an entity called petty mal status. It was not petty mal. It was uh, patients who were not fully conscious, who had rhythm, who had rhythmic activity uh, around three hertz. Uh, there was no specific change in frequency as far as I remember. And the term petty mal status was used. I don't know what it meant. It meant some kind of non-convulsive seizure. Uh, do you know what happened to that entity and whether it in fact evolved into non-convulsive status? Uh, so I'll say yes. So people who have you know kids with childhood absence can go into absence status, but I don't think that's what you're talking about, right? No. This yeah. was not a childhood phenomenon. It was classified according to the, the frequency of, of, of fairly rhythmic activity, which didn't really change in frequency, about three to four hertz. Right. So, what yes, that, that was would... Al altered consciousness. Yep. That would just be called generalized non-convulsive status epilepticus now. Okay. Uh, okay. the, actually, we still see that the most common time we see that is in elderly with benzo withdrawal. But I don't, it's not a common thing to have the three hertz that's not changing much. It's usually slower with much more fluctuation. And uh, I don't know, you still see those patients? Does anybody see uh, them? I, they, they kind of, the entity kind of gradually disappeared over the years. <laughs> hmm. And people use other terms such as, uh, you know, non-convulsive seizures. Uh, uh, some people felt it was a, it was with temporal lobe status, which had been missed in its origin and become generalized. Uh, uh, but uh, th that term disappeared, but it was prominently used even when I did my uh, clinical neurophysiology boards uh, in the 1980s. Yeah, so that would just be called, well, technically it's now, we, that would be electroclinical status epilepticus. Okay. <laughs> if they have clear clinical correlate, it's not just electrical status epilepticus, so we would be uh, right. And it falls under the non-convulsive category, yep. Yeah, the patients were all had less than consciousness. Uh, they may not all be in an unresponsive coma, but they all were, but none of them were, were really conscious, sir. So. Right, yeah, those are the kind that respond nicely to treatment. They're, they're very, uh, Usually, those are the those are the kinds that are gratifying to take care of because you, you give them a shot of benzos or something else, and they wake up or become alert and say thank you. We don't get that too often in the acute brain injury patients. Why the term ever arose, I don't know, because there was no history of absences in most of them. Many of them were adults with no history of childhood absence epilepsy. But the term, nevertheless, was used. <laughs> yeah. Why? Well, I so, guess the, the three hertz and generalized was enough for people to say it was similar. So. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. You can email me any other questions. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Hirsch. All right, take care. Okay. All right, thanks everyone. Have a great weekend.